college debate surrounding Alaska's large mine permitting process, with his advisor, Vinci Kennecott. Jonathan received his bachelor's degree in social analysis and research from Brown. Um, two truths and a lie about Jonathan. Sometimes Jonathan pours coffee into oatmeal instead of milk. Currently, Jonathan is not wearing socks. <laughs> Didn't find that one. Jonathan has never been Colchester. Um. <laughs> and so Jonathan's presentation today will be titled Land Use, Power, and Knowledge in the Northern Resource Frontier, a case study of the Donlin Gold Public Engagement Process. And there it is. So, hi. Um, so I've been working with uh, Bindu on public engagement in large mine permitting in Alaska for a few years now, before I showed up here and then showed up here to keep doing that. And uh, so we started out looking at the uh, pebble mine in southwestern Alaska on Bristol Bay, which is something you all might have heard of, kind of a big controversial mining project down there. Um, but today I'm going to talk about some more recent work that we've been doing around a different mine in Alaska, uh, the Donlin Gold Project, which is a little north of Pebble, um, kind of west central Alaska. Um, Work so far has been based on about 20 to 25 interviews that I conducted last winter and this summer, and uh, some you know, quantitative stuff that is less interesting. But um, major questions that have sort of been going through projects around all the different mining things we've been looking at is uh, kind of what defines a landscape's value and who gets to make that decision. And sort of nested under that are questions, right, of the construction of uh, science, technology, and politics how those shape discourses of value and sort of within that necessarily we have to talk about some of the kind of onto epistemic questions around how people relate to the land and uh, how people construct uh, knowledge of the land as well. Um, so I'll just have time to introduce some background stuff on Donlin and give some like preliminary thoughts coming out of these interviews so far. Um, so there's, there's a laser pointer here. That's uh, the Donlin Gold site. It's one of about eight uh, proposed large mines in Alaska at the moment. It's, uh, that's how big it is. It's a big place. It's, uh, the claim is owned by uh, Barrick and Nova Gold. Barrick's the largest mining company in the world. Uh, Nova's a smaller one that really is only involved in Donlin. And then the Chalista Corporation is also involved. That's the uh, native corporation that owns the land. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, so these are all kind of newer, low-grade, enormous projects that are kind of trying to pull the last vestiges of uh, mineral resources out of Alaskans, out of Alaska's uh, land. You know, all the all the good stuff they got about 100 years ago. Um, so some. Really quick background, you could talk about land questions in Alaska all day, but I won't because it's interesting, but we don't have time. And uh, Alaska is a funny place, right? So land ownership there is divided mostly between uh, the federal government, owns about that much, a little over 60% of Alaskan land. Uh, the state owns about 25%, and uh, private owners own about 12%. And that 12% is really interesting because if we go back to... Uh, about 1867, the U.S. purchases Alaska from Russia. Um, federal government, you know, gains title to all of Alaskan land at that point. But they never dealt with the claims to land by native Alaskan folks. Um, those hadn't been dealt with when Russia was sort of claiming the region and, and weren't dealt with when the U.S. bought it from Russia either. Um, statehood rolls around in 1959, still not dealt with. And uh, it's not until folks discover oil on the North Slope in the late 60s, and they want to run a pipeline from there down to Valdez. Valdez is famous because of a big oil spill. You know, oil came out of the pipeline, went on a ship, the ship ran aground and spilled into the ocean. Um, but they finally sort of realized they had to deal with the question of native Alaskan claims uh, to land ownership. And they did that um, with something called the Native, uh, native Claims Settlement Act, which kind of built a, a land ownership process that was really different in the lower 48. Um, Alaska Native communities uh, relinquished title to all land in Alaska in exchange for about a billion dollars and uh, a whole bunch of land that was not under the sovereign title, not under like, like the reserve system in the States, 
um, or, in, or in Canada, but which is owned similar to any other private land. And that land is owned by uh, 12 different regional corporations, um, which are made up of, so these are the different regions. You got Chalista over here, right, Bellman's over there. And these corporations are just, you know, like any other corporation, job is to profit off of the lands that they own. And their shareholders are the native Alaskan folks that live in those regions. Um, so you end up with an interesting situation where uh, a whole bunch of land in Alaska, most of the privately owned land in Alaska, is owned by these 12 corporations whose kind of job is to use that land to provide services to their shareholders, which necessarily in Alaska often means resource development. So that's you know, a long, long introduction. Um, the Donlin Project is interesting particularly because it sits on uh, Chalista-owned land. A lot of other major resource development projects sit on state land or federal land, so this changes kind of the calculation of stakeholders and, and questions of value. Um, there's Donlin, sits right between the Cusp Green River here and the Yukon River up there. Um, what are my notes I have to say? Bunch of gold. The design, uh, it's an open pit design about a mile by 2.2 .2 miles across. And uh, solid waste would go into one pit, uh, liquid mine tailings into another pit, which they build by damming up a valley. Um, be about a 27 year lifeline, uh, lifetime for the mine, and it be expected to produce about 3 billion tons of rock and tailings. And so the project would also require like really significant infrastructure. Um, they'd have to build an airstrip, to build, uh, you know, a mine, dig a, dig a big hole. And they'd also have to run a pipeline from Cook Inlet, about 315 miles up to the, up to the project site, to provide power, natural gas. And that pipeline would run, for part of it, across the Iditarod Trail, um, which you've probably heard of, you know, Iditarod. And they'd also have to run a bunch of barges up the Cuscaroon River to bring shit into the mine and also to bring the, the gold out. Um, and that's sort of where the main concerns come, whoops, hold up. where the main concerns uh, arise for people in the region, right, is that major inf infrastructure development and also a uh, bunch of barges on the river and the possibility of a tailings dam failure, um, which would significantly harm the ecosystem. Um, Seems like kind of a far out possibility, but just a couple years ago, uh, the Mount Polly mine in uh, British Columbia had a tailings dam disaster, and that was, you know, inundated the local rivers and destroyed the fish, fish populations there. Possibility, people are concerned. Um, where are we now? So, the uh, Yukon Kuskokwim region is a uh, place where folks largely get their livelihood and their survival from subsistence fishing. Um, Cuscogrim River actually has the largest subsistence harvest of Chinook salmon um, in Alaska, and also pretty significant uh, harvest of other salmon, and uh, three distinct uh, Native Alaskan communities along the river, uh, kind of divided between the upper, middle, and lower sections. Um, something that's particularly interesting about how things operate on the Kuskokwim is that salmon is managed kind of collectively. There's a coalition state and uh, local actors who uh, work together to figure out salmon harvest questions. Um, and pretty recently, the upper, middle, and lower Kuskokwim were able to get together and kind of, for the first time, start to cooperatively, cooperatively uh, manage the, their own subsistence harvesting. Um, so, that's a fish, it was really tasty. Um, and that's, you know, subsistence fishing is kind of the only thing that folks got there. Um, we were talking about the pebble mine earlier, that's a really interesting case because there's a massive commercial fishery. Um, but up the Cuscoquin, there just like isn't that kind of industry. Um, there's no roads, the only way to get there is by plane or by boat. The only way to get around between different villages is also by boat. And uh, the poverty level is about 21.5%, 16% um, unemployment. 
So it's really economically depressed, right? So this is where we come to like the main kind of set of questions around Dalin in particular to make it interesting is that it would provide kind of the only source of employment in the region aside from uh, fish management jobs that are run by the state. You know, there's a couple guys that do that, and that's about it. Um, while at the same time providing a pretty serious threat to people's subsistence livelihoods. And so unlike the pebble question, which saw really strong uh, opposition in Alaska, in the region, and internationally, Dalman's really flown under the radar while simultaneously like leading to a whole bunch of uh, division within communities. Um, so, and the Dalin company, company like really knows what they're doing. They've, uh, as I said before, Barrick is the largest mining company in the world. Uh, most of their projects are in the third world and they're really talented at uh, building mines even when people don't really want them. Um, so they've been in the Kuskokwim region for about 10 or 20 years, um, sponsoring dog sled races, uh, sports teams, and handing out sweet stuff. Um, so they've built a lot of goodwill over time. And uh, this is a uh, Dave Cannon stayed with him. And he got a bag from Donlin, and he's proud of it because it's the bag that he keeps his uh, latrine shovel in when he goes out into the bush. Um, he doesn't really want them to be able to mine. Um, fish biologist is a really strange dude. Um, at the moment, the uh, Dunland project is in a going under an environmental impact assessment, which is run by the Army Corps of Engineers. They published a uh, draft assessment, which is uh, people had like six months to review that, put in some public comments, and they're currently looking over the public comments on the draft EIS to produce a final version. Um, well, let's see. I always go over time. So. Moving on, I want to talk about two things. First, going to look at some of the major community concerns that are surrounded in this mine. And second of all, I want to tell a really quick story from some of the conversations we had uh, that touch on some of the major questions of our research. So that's really small, but uh, the guy I'm working with, Ben, went through and uh, coded all the public comments on the draft EIS uh, for the major community concerns. Um, Folks in favor largely supported it because of the economic benefits, cited the good relationship between Donlin and the community, and also, where are we? Uh, emphasized that they didn't think there would be much environmental impact. Um, folks who were opposed uh, largely are concerned with threats to subsistence resources, um, the effects of increased barging on the river, and uh, impacts of the pipeline. So, this is Bert, that's uh, Dave's dog, he's about 15 years old. Um, I have like no time. But main thought coming out of these sets of interviews is that the environmental impact statement process asks for really particular technical questions or technical responses to uh, the mine design uh, documents. Those are difficult for people to read, um, scientifically and technically challenging, and the impact statement itself is about this high. If you you put it all in the books and put it on the ground. Um, and so it's extremely difficult for people in the region to interact with that process. Um, coming out of the, what came out of that process, however, was a pretty powerful coalition of lawyers and scientists and uh, community activists who were able to work with folks in the region to kind of translate the assessment knowledge into something that was understandable going this way, right? And going the other way, translate uh, some of the traditional ecological knowledge and experiential knowledge that people in the region have into something that would be legible to the state. And uh, that's a process that's not captured in the environmental impact statement process. Um, and in fact, the uh, way that they troll through the uh, public comments is really similar to how we did, coding them for really particular specific kind of technical responses, um, which by design is unable to capture 
uh, ways of looking at the land and ways of looking at the world that don't match um, some of the uh, technical scientific approaches that the state takes to assessing environmental risk. Um, out of time, so that's that's about it. We're gonna finish up going through the interviews and try to figure out what people really think. Yeah. Yeah. It also makes it a lot easier for you to interpret it, um, but it also squashes uh, the amount of time you've got to comment. Uh, so if, if that was to happen with the mind, you know, what sorts of, what's your take on how people could interpret that information mm -hmm. and get their voices heard and then, you know, also like, make meaningful change? Yeah, so that was one of the main, um, sort of the main strategies that folks who were dealing with the impact assessment process took was initially they were going to be limited to only a month to respond um, to the thousands of pages of scientific data. And they were able to kind of successfully ask the Army Corps to give them six months instead. And so I think when people express the need for a statement or an assessment process that is more understandable and uh, less sort of onerous on the community, um, they're not asking for a uh, less robust statement or less robust sort of environmental assessment or less robust treatment of risk, um, but are asking for uh, a more significant seat in the decision-making table at, at how that process works and who's involved and uh, what kinds of knowledge are considered legitimate. Um, so the way it's organized at the moment there's sort of a necessity for folks in the region to have contacts with uh, often expensive contractors and consultants to interpret the data, whereas their own kind of really deep knowledge of what's going on in the river is often not taken seriously unless it's backed up by the kind of data that the state wants to see. And so it's asking, you know, not for like a less complete assessment, but one that's done in a way that uh, fits a little better with local needs. <laughs>